Hello and welcome to the Rock and Roll to Success. Today I have my friend Stephen Boucher directly from Wisconsin, right? He has yeah, from his, <laughs> his little yeah, from friends, Wisconsin. Bean and Sadie over there as well. His black cats. Yeah. There's Sadie. But yeah, Bean's up there being a troublemaker. Yeah, it's so. always the, the little brother or sister that is the troublemaker with cats. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's kind of strange, too. Like She makes strange sounds when she runs up the stairs. It's like, uh, we're not really sure she's a cat, basically. <laughs> Sometimes we think she might be like a muskrat or some other type of large rodent. But, yeah. Yeah, nowadays animals have these identification problems sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so man you were telling me that as a kid you were obsessed with climbing trees and with spider-man with pokemon so how was it as a kid and how do you think that this made you not only literally a bug hunter but also figuratively <laughs> a bug hunter <laughs> Well, I don't know. I think I just grew up, like, really obsessed with insects. Like, I was one of those kids who uh, wanted to get wanted to go capture all the bugs I could find outside and study them for, like, a few days. And then, you know, I would want to let them go because I felt bad about, like, keeping them in there forever. Some kids I knew would just be like, well, it's mine now, so, <laughs> like, I don't... <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I think life is precious. Like just let it, let it kill the rest of its life. But uh, yeah, like my my family kind of encouraged me, and we'd go on hikes sometimes and uh, look under logs for salamanders out east when I visited my grandparents out in Maryland. But yeah, I think I think it all stemmed from this general like curiosity about the world around me, and I really wanted to like go see what was in these like hidden places. So I think climbing trees was a big way of doing that. Um, I'd look up a tree and think like, what's up there? Like, I wonder if there's like an animal or something. Maybe I'll find like a cool spider. I don't know. I'm, I'm terrified of spiders, but like, yeah, I, I think that just this general, this general curiosity and want, desire to explore the world kind of led me to uh, being more open when like years later in high school my dad came into my room and he asked like hey I'm going to Walmart you want to just do, do you want like a new video game you haven't gotten one in a while I'm like okay and so I had to like search real quick on the internet like oh man I, I can't waste this opportunity I have to find something good so uh, I saw Mirror's Edge had been getting a lot of praise and so I'm like yeah, this looks like a cool game. Can you go get this one? And he's like, sure. So he comes back, I play it. I'm like, whoa, what's this character doing? Like, it's like jumping off roofs and stuff. And I'm like, I kind of want to, kind of want to see if, like, what this is. And so I found out it had a name. It was called, like, Parkour or Free Running. And I ended up looking up like a tutorial because I saw people were learning how to do this in real life. And yeah, I started, <laughs> it, it all started with me uh, just in front of my TV with the game still on, but um, I had my laptop with a parkour roll tutorial, like on the couch nearby. And I was just like on the carpet practicing how to roll. And, you know, cause it was February. Like, there was snow everywhere outside. I'm like, I'm not going outside to do this. So that's kind of how it started. <clears throat> but, I mean, it led to, like, this whole journey where I I just really wanted to, like, see what I could do. Because I met people who did this all the time, and I learned how to do more advanced techniques and you know, before I knew it, I was climbing 12 foot walls and vaulting over tables in like wow. really weird ways. And people thought like I was crazy, <laughs> but I don't know. It was just fun. It was just like climbing trees for me. It was another way of exploring the world. I don't think people realize how much confidence that stuff gives you. Oh, I can only imagine like jumping from a ledge or onto another <laughs> building. That must take a lot of confidence. Yeah, there were some people I knew that were a bit more unhinged than me and they like earlier in their journey they were willing to like climb up we had like this local 
movie theater in town where I grew up. And there was like this little alleyway where, so you have like this, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this, but um, small town stuff where there's like a big parking lot behind like a strip of like different buildings and businesses. But then you have to walk through this little alleyway to get up to the front where like the street is by the movie theater. And so in this alleyway, it's like, I don't know, like maybe it wasn't that wide. It was like maybe two people could stand like next to each other in this alleyway. But there was a way you could, in the front of the building, climb up to the top of this building because there was like a fire escape. But you could also do like the little spider monkey thing where you like, you know, you're like one hand on each wall with the legs and then you kind of like go up like that. And so my, I had this friend who was like totally fine with climbing up to the top of this building that had to have been like 15 to 20 feet tall and then just like running and jumping across the alleyway from the top. And that scared the crap out of me. Like I'm not, I am I never did anything like that except maybe once at like a state park. But it scared me enough where I'm like, I, I'm okay not doing death defying stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I'll just keep my stuff lower to the ground. <laughs> personally yeah man there are people that really don't uh, aren't afraid of dying i guess i don't know some people just have a really high risk tolerance i i think i like to think of myself as a calculated risk taker like i think about so what is this worth to me like what am i getting out of this but also what am i willing to lose here <laughs> does anyone <laughs> depend on me and it's funny because when you get married and you start having people who expect you to come home every day. You stop wanting to take as many of these risks. <laughs> and you're more choosy about which ones you, you do take. You know, you only do the yeah. things you're really confident that will work out, basically. Yeah. And, and do you think that parkour helped you in any way, like growing up and becoming more confident or other skills? Not only, of course, the physical skills that you have to develop, but other skills that you could transfer to other parts of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think like before parkour, I, I don't know, like my life was just going to school. Like my main challenge was just getting good grades. And most of the time that wasn't too hard. I was one of those kids, you know, but uh, yeah, other than that, I guess my parents got me into violin and like orchestra since like fourth grade so i i never really chose that for myself i just kind of did it because it ended up being fun um so i had that and i had video games those were like my two things and i mean i just felt like there was something missing like i didn't have any excitement about working out at all so i didn't really have any physical strength to boast of i remember like all the kids in my class were like uh always impressed by those guys who go to the gym all the time and have like huge biceps and i'm just like yeah i don't know i guess i have a bicep that's cool right no. <laughs> it's just uh yeah i don't know i i think that parkour finally gave me an avenue that i wanted to work out like it gave me a reason to actually go out and exercise because it didn't feel like exercise it was like play but it also showed me a lot about what I'm capable of and what I'm not capable. Like there was a lot of self-knowledge in that. It was kind of like a meditative journey in a way, um, journey of self-discovery. And I met a lot of people who taught me a lot about myself too. And so I think after there was like this three year period where I was like all in on parkour and it was like all I talked about, all I did for the most part. And after that, I felt like I was just more willing to take more risks and take bets on myself. And I think it really came in handy when I needed it. There was this time in college where my dad, like, I, I had like one or two semesters left, right? So I, I, I think at this point, I realized I didn't want to be a teacher because... I had had a work experience at a summer camp that didn't go super well. <laughs> and I'm like, I feel like teaching is going to be worse than this. <laughs> like, it just seemed like managing kids wasn't my forte and I really didn't like doing it. And that's like most of what you have to do as a school teacher. It's not just about imparting knowledge. But 
Yeah, my dad and I were driving home from the airport after my study abroad in Spain, which, you know, part of my Spanish major, Spanish teaching major. And he said, like, uh, we won't, I, so we won't be able to pay for your school anymore or Emily's, like my sister. Uh, so y'all are going to have to either hold off or go get a job and pay for the rest of it. <laughs> like basically their, their savings for our schooling had run out because both of us were taking longer than four years. Oh man. Yeah. So that kind of hit me like a a ton of bricks, man. Like I'm like, I didn't think I'd have to have a job before I finished college. <laughs> I, no, yeah, what? hella privileged. I get it. <laughs> but like... As a kid who felt like he still needed to be taken care of by his parents, like, he wasn't ready to go out on his own yet, um, it kind of threw me into, like, this oh shit moment where I'm like, uh, okay, so how am I going to do this? <laughs> what am I going to do? And so I got a job packing boxes at Amazon, basically. And during that, I realized I never want to do this again. And I need to, I need to change something because, like, this is going to be my life if I don't do something. And that confidence from parkour, I think, came back and it reminded me like, hey, you can you can find a way around this. You know, you can find a way through this obstacle. You just have to figure it out. And so that's kind of when I decided to learn to code and try to become a web developer. And you know, I'll save I'll save the story. Fast forward two years, I ended up in QA, but it that gave me the basis to upon which to build like a really good career and i don't think most people think that way when they end up in that situation they just kind of accept their circumstances i don't know do what most people would do which is just work a job try to get promoted take the path of least resistance basically and then look back 10 years and wonder why they didn't do something else but <laughs> i guess i just felt like like no like i I, I shouldn't accept that for myself. I, I deserve to see what I'm capable of. And it worked out. And so I always tell people, like, parkour really gave me that confidence to try something crazy and different and new just to see if it would work. You know, it turned me into sort of an experimenter, a, a scientist of life, I guess. Dude, that's awesome. And from a place that we never imagined and you gathered so much confidence to be able to do these things. And now you help people with this also, because like you said, many people just go through the motions and they spend 10, 15 years doing the same job, never getting promoted. Or if they do get promoted, they get like a 5% raise, like nothing really changes. They just yeah. get more responsibility and pretty much don't get anything for it. And then, they wonder what happened to these 10 or 15 years of my life. Like they look at it and they don't even remember really what happened because it was just the same thing. And yeah. I think that's a great thing that you're doing now, helping these people to have that confidence and being able to look for something new, something else that they could do with their lives. Yeah. It's, and, and you know, I didn't, I didn't start doing this like right away when I got into tech. I'm not like, oh, I already know how this all works, and I just got here. I, I think like when I got there, I was as curious. Well, I mean, I, I was just trying to like not get fired. Basically, <laughs> that was my only goal at the time. Um, basically, my first job into tech because I, I realized after two years of trying to apply to a developer position that I just wasn't going to get it because my skills were not where they I knew they needed to be, and I didn't have the motivation to grow them to where they needed to be. <laughs> I'm like, well, this is just me trying to like take a shortcut. I, I feel like I need, to ch I need to pivot here to something I know I'm actually qualified for, and so that's how I got my first job in support. Basically doing customer service for a tech company. Like it's, I was already doing a lot of customer service, like years of, and years of it in different capacities, and now I know how to code. So combine the two, technical customer support. So I immediately got a call back when I first applied to one of those. <laughs> uh, they're like, yeah, please, please come interview. You look like a great candidate versus me applying to a dev role. They're like either crickets or yeah, you're too green, <laughs> <laughs> which was true. So 
you know, I just played to my strengths and, you know, luckily a QA department was starting to get built six months after I started. And that's kind of how I met the QA manager and how that QA journey started. But even when I started that, I was still just trying not to get fired. I'm like, I'm lucky I even got this far. Like, I'm looking around thinking, is this real? Like, what? <laughs> like, I was working at Walgreens, like, less than a year ago. Um, this is nuts. But, you know, some of the QA people took me under their wing. And that's where I found, like, wow, this mentorship thing is really great. Like, I I know I could have just Googled this stuff or gone on Udemy, but it wouldn't have been the same. It's not real world. And so just seeing the kindness of people on that team who are willing to like answer my a million questions <laughs> as a junior. Uh, I just, I think it just made me want to repay the favor down the road. And, you know, turns out I'm actually really good at QA and testing and, you know, it, it's the curiosity thing probably which was nurtured by parkour. It's the attention to detail, caring about the user, having a good time, you know, all that stuff. It just goes into making a good tester. And my career took off. I got like raise after raise and promote opportunity after opportunity until like I pretty much like doubled my income from when I was in support. And I was starting a mentoring program within QA. Uh, with a coworker, and we were trying to teach the manual testers how to learn automation so they could automate some tests and maybe change their lives too, like move their career from manual to automation and code for a living. And that was like super rewarding. But, you know, for reasons I won't get into, <laughs> I had to leave that company after three years, which was the longest I'd ever worked at any company. And I left for like a 20% raise at another company doing the same thing, but a little harder. And then mm -hmm. I left that for a 20% raise at this company. And so I think I just noticed, like, I feel like I'm doing something right here, you know, like, and I feel like there's a lot of people who don't get it because they're not doing as well. <laughs> and I kind of just wanted to fix that. So I started doing some mentoring online but but yeah it all it all kind of started at that first company like back at fetch where they gave me a chance to try to be a qa i didn't suck and i got <laughs> hella rewarded for it and yeah I, I started seeing how good it felt to help other people achieve similar success you know people started to like people were telling me all the time they're like you're like an inspiration, dude. Like you, you went from support all the way to like QA automation engineer in the span of like a year and a half. And wow. there's, I remember hearing from people in support who uh, joined like maybe around the same time I did or even after. And they're like, Hey, how can I get into QA or some testers on my team who were like, how do I, how do I get to the automation side? And they were all looking to me like I had the, all the answers. And I'm like, I didn't, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I just kind of made it. Like, I, I guess I learned web development before I joined the company. That might have helped. But um, other than that, I thought I was just doing my job, you know. I had no clue what I was doing. And that bothered the hell out of me. <laughs> I'm like, I want to give these people a good answer. Like, why can't I give them an answer? And that's actually where that course that you were talking about before we started recording came from. Me trying to give them an answer. I spent like, I spent like so much time trying to <laughs> give them a good answer. And it lives on the internet now on Udemy. That's my answer. But um, I don't know. Do you want to talk about that? Do you want me to like go into how that even Yeah, happens? definitely, man. <laughs> I just like to comment that. It seems like you really found the sweet spot between all of your quirks and all of your talents because, like you said, with parkour, you were on to exploring and improving your confidence. And you also really liked, you know, going to the woods and looking for animals, bugs, toads, <laughs> salamanders. So you were already you already had that eye for detail and for looking for things. And also 
you study teaching, so you already have that, you know, those abilities to help people and teach them something and break down some concepts. So I think you kind of are reaching a place where you can use all of these strengths or all of these talents that you develop throughout the years. And I think maybe that's also a reason why it's sometimes it's hard for you to tell other people how you did it because you kind of are <laughs> in a place where you were kind of destined to go because it gets all of your little quirks, all of your talents and kind of brings it together. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because the only reason I even got started trying like on this journey was just trying to see way, like way back then in like 2017, when I decided to learn to code, um, that, that wasn't a random decision. It was, uh, it wasn't even somebody telling me to do it because they thought it was like a cool way to go make more money in a, another career. It was, it was me like soul searching and like taking inventory of, what what do I currently have? Like, what do I even have to offer, you know? And what do I need to get in order to get what I want out of a career? Like, what do I still need to go learn? And so, you know, I, I made a list. I, I think you can find videos like this all over the place in the career pivot space, you know, on YouTube. But you get out a notebook, you make three columns, and... I mean, this is literally what I did. I wish I still had the notebook paper. Maybe I do somewhere, but like, or I threw it out. But it's strengths, weakness, well, strengths, weaknesses, likes and dislikes. I think I started there. Just things that like, I was thinking back to all of my school experiences, like school subjects. Uh, I was thinking back to my jobs, the kinds of tasks I did at work. Um... And then maybe ways I've informally helped, like, friends and family, uh, just activities I've done for fun, like hobbies. And I, I let all of those be, like, valid responses in the, uh, or, like, sources of information. Just, like, a holistic view of my life, you know? I'm like, okay, like, what is my life, basically? Like, what do I like doing? What do I dislike doing? Um, what am I good at? And what do I suck at? Um, and I just wanted, like, that whole picture on one page. And then from there, this is where you might hear the more traditional advice, which is you take some of those strengths, interests, and what makes money, you know, and you try to make them all meet, sort of. So you, you try to look at the strengths and interests column and be like, okay, well, which of these actually looks like a job, you know? And so... I, I couldn't really come up with anything very good, you know, because it was, you don't know what you don't know. So I'm like, I guess I need to know more options then. So I, I was still at this point, not sure, like, spoiler alert, I did finish college. But uh, at this point, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish college. So let's assume I won't. So I looked up on the internet careers that make at least $40,000 a year without a college degree. And there's a whole bunch, man. Like, a lot of them were in, like, the trades or the military or something, but there were a few that were in, like, creative disciplines, too, and I'm like, I kind of see myself as a creative person, just, like, based on this list. And I like to solve problems. I like critical thinking. Um, I, I like languages. I like learning languages. And so I I kind of, like, piece these things together and, and like, I, I was looking at the list and I saw a web developer, read the description. I'm like, that kind of sounds like me. And so I looked up what it takes to go do that. I'm like, well, fuck it. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> so uh, I looked up on YouTube all these videos and people were saying, yeah, you can do this in like six to 12 months. And I'm like, that sounds reasonable. I was so wrong. <laughs> but, you know, you find out later. Everybody is still believing this when they start out in the industry because they really want it to be true. But I mean, I think the take home, the takeaway is like, it's still possible. There's just a lot of work that goes into it and you have to have a lot of time on your hands to be able to do it in six to 12 months. So, but I mean, I, I learned enough to be dangerous and I think I never really thought computer programming was for me. I always thought it was for the math nerds. And I wasn't really, like, I was good at math, but I didn't like math. 
that was on my list too under dislikes like and it was under strengths <laughs> it's like i'm good but i i hate it <laughs> don't make me do math <laughs> and i found out you, you don't really need a lot of math no i mean i still just i have this thing on my bucket list just to like prove i can do it like I go take a calculus class online <laughs> and get an a <laughs> Because I skipped calculus. I never, I, I got out of it. So I'm, I'm like one of those kids who just never had to take calculus. Um, even though everyone in college seems to tell you, that, oh, you got to take it because like you need the math credits to graduate. It's like, I just did other math credits. <laughs> like I didn't take <laughs> calculus. But that's another story, by the way. It's, that was absurd. But uh, yeah, it turns out uh, you don't really need more than basic algebra to do programming for web development it's really not that math intensive it's a lot more language intensive understanding the syntax understanding uh just logic so if you like philosophy or rhetoric like debates stuff like that you probably have a logical enough brain to learn programming because <laughs> you're really just telling a computer what to do that's it you're also teaching the computer sort of but you know, it only understands it if you say it a certain way. I don't know. I, I'm kind of getting lost. I forgot where I was going with all of this. What What was the question? I don't remember as well, but <laughs> I, I think that's an interesting point you got to, man, about how programming is more about the logic than math. And that we have this illusion that it's super math intensive, but actually it's pretty much you don't really have math at all unless you're doing a specific program that's doing some kind of engineering thing, maybe yeah. more STEM based, but for most programming, it's pretty much just language. Yeah. Like there was this one guy at, when I was working at Trek, he had the task of making like a, some simulator for, uh, there, there was this app we were trying to hook up to like a radar device. So that it would tell you if cars were behind you. If you if you like put this device on your bike, then your app will show you like, is there a car sneaking up behind you? Um, that requires math <laughs> because it's a math problem. <laughs> like you have to find out how far this car away is from you based on the distance it is from the radar unit and how fast it's going based on. Like, if it blinks and keeps checking the distance, like, how fast is that distance increasing <laughs> or decreasing? Mm -hmm. uh, but, like, making a portfolio web page, no math. None at all. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like people still have that misconception to this day, and people stay away from it because they think they're not smart enough. It's literally just, like, painting for nerdy people. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's all it is. Like, you're just putting language on a page and it turns into a picture that's web development um i mean there's a lot more to it when you get into like web apps that have like server side stuff and all these database features but if you're literally just making a website like anybody can do that they can learn how to do that in like a week so i wish i had known that i guess you know, it just looks a lot harder than it actually is. <laughs> Things the easy stuff. But, you know, just like uh, in baseball or any sport, right? There's an easy, low-hanging fruit skill that you can learn to kind of get yourself hooked on it. Like putting a ball on a tee and hitting it. It's like, you hit the ball. Good for you. You want to try hitting it while someone throws it at you? <laughs> hmm. So, so yeah, I think all I was trying to get at there with this whole long-winded thing was um, you got to, like, take inventory of what your strengths are. Because, like you said, like, I got here because of, like, a variety of different things. Like, some things were set up in my childhood. Other things were kind of, like, learned through other experiences as I got older. But I, I think there's not enough moments in life where we all, like, myself included, even to this day, like, sit down and really just take inventory of, like, okay, well, what's, like the sum total of like what I have to offer the world, like what options do I have? And like, people don't think about it as much as they should. That Like the more skills you get, the more options you have, because there's more combinations of things that you can make. Like the more, the more pieces you have, I guess the more, it's like Legos, right? You get like a, 
maybe you start out in life with like a 10 piece Lego set. It's like, well, I guess I can build like a, a tower, <laughs> but <laughs> then you get like, over time you get all these experiences and skills and ideally, right. If you're growing and then like a f- years later, maybe you have like a 120 piece Lego set. It's like, well, I could build all sorts of stuff. Now I could build a car, I could build a house, I could build a dinosaur. I don't know. Like, and I think we all just sit in this, like what other people tell us is possible world. And we don't think about what we want like even if it's not something we think is possible just yet cuz that's where the gold is man like the gold is in finding out a new way of doing things because if we just do what everyone else has done already then it's not really going to i feel like it do, it's not going to yield as much yeah because you have that invaluable gold that only you have because you have different lego pieces that you can mix and match into different things that no other person can right and, you know, as you were f- talking about this, I was thinking, man, this could be a badass product and this could help <laughs> so so many people just by helping them figure out what are their strengths and weaknesses and what are the possible paths that they could go. And I think this could really become a very interesting product if you wanted to. And also another thing I was going to ask. Like, if you could go back to your beginning in this journey as a QA, at analyzing data, coding, all of that, if you could talk to yourself when you were beginning, what would you tell him so that you could make the journey faster or that you could not suffer as much for some things that you might have suffered for? And, like, what would you tell him? Well, I think I probably would have said that I should have chilled out a little bit. Um, I I had to learn that from a boss. Like my first boss in QA taught me how to live a life well. <laughs> I think because I was I was working out of fear like all the time, and nobody expected it from me. It's not like people were hounding me or anything. But he did. He taught me like this idea of it can wait till Monday, and I would always be that person who was like, oh, no, but I have to finish it on Friday. I have to, like, keep going until, like, 6 or 7 or, like, 8 p.m. <laughs> some days. Mm-hmm. and Or I'd, like, check in on the weekend to see how things were going. And, and I mean, to be fair, I really like the company. But, like, so it was kind of addicting. It was like a video game. For the first time in my life, I actually enjoyed going to work. And he's like, careful, you know, that's that's not really a healthy way to live your life. You know, just, uh, I don't know. I think he just led by example. He was having more fun than I was. And this is how he was doing things. I'm like, well, I'll just copy him. And so the next company I went to, I actually started setting boundaries and like, I'll, I'm done after five. Doesn't matter. Like I'll, I'll make sure the work fits in that window and then just not checking my phone after that. And I, I guess, to answer your question, I just wish I had done that earlier because I think that it's hard to really enjoy your journey if you're worried all the time. <laughs> like, you feel like you're just trying to chase the next goal and, like, that's fine. But I think I think there's also something to be said for kind of slowing things down just a teensy bit so that you can kind of, you know, like, enjoy the ride. So I wouldn't say I would want to accelerate because I was going like way too fast anyways. <laughs> like I was going like room. Um, maybe the only thing that could have helped me was like find out about software testing earlier. <laughs> I don't know because that was definitely a better fit for me. And what about your experience in Spain? How long were you there and how was it? <laughs> oh, man, I, I have so much nostalgia about that. There There were admittedly... There was like this undercurrent of like emotional stress during that whole time I was there. And it wasn't because of Spain. It was because of my dumb self and like what I was doing with my relationships at the time. <laughs> but, oh man, Spain is so beautiful. Um, well, I remember the first shock to my system going there was stepping off the plane onto the tarmac because I never really did that before. Only like into an airport. So to step out onto the runway was kind of cool. And it was like 44 degrees Celsius that day. I was like, I'm in an oven. (laughs) 
where what is going on here it's never been this hot back home but it's like dry so i like don't care but also you know it sneaks up on you you gotta drink water so i don't know it was it was like really hard to adjust the first couple of days because i'd never been anywhere where i had to like speak another language so um i just i don't know if it was jet lag or just like the language barrier getting used to that for two weeks i was just like so tired like every day i just wanted to like lay in bed and watch netflix (laughs) half the time (laughs) but when i had enough energy like i would still kind of go and explore i thought like you know I'm in a different land. I am maybe never going to be able to go here again. So let's just see what's here. And I actually, funny enough, I found a parkour class there. I had to walk two hours to get to it. Um, But I was, I was crazy. Like, I just didn't care. I was having a great time in Spain and I just saw it as like a chance to see more of the city. So I walked like two hours instead of taking what, like an Uber or something. (laughs) So, um, I got to this class and it was, uh, actually it wasn't even a class. It was an event. I guess I I heard about on their website, there was like this parkour jam they were having and these people were nuts, dude. Like I had never seen anything like it except on YouTube and yeah, these people were, like, doing flips and stuff over all these obstacles, and uh, it it was... I had been to, like, four parkour events back home, but I had never seen anything that advanced. And so I was just kind of standing off to the side, like, I'm intimidated. I don't speak their language very well. <laughs> I'm just gonna watch! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I left after a while, but... I mean, I was there for school, though, so I guess... Um, it was like a, it was a fun weekend adventure. I don't know. It it was, I'm not sure. What do you want me to talk about the Spain? (laughs) I feel like I'm going to, whatever you want, man. Like, (laughs) what do you miss about it? Where were you? Like, what were your favorite parts? Well, to be fair, I, uh, I, we finally, five years later after that experience, got, I got to take my wife there. And so my nostalgia is it's a little fr- it's been appeased a little bit like i've already gone back and i've experienced a lot of the same stuff over again and it's very different the second time around but the first time it was just like unbelievable like if you go to granada the alhambra like chef's kiss man it is so beautiful like we didn't get to go to the sierra nevada that time my wife and i did and we actually like paraglided off of the sierra nevada wow. Um, that was, that was crazy. (laughs) But I remember, I remember being with the whole, like, group of students and just standing up there with, like, the view of, like, the city down below. And then behind us, if we looked up, we could see, like, this expanse of mountains. I'm like, man, I wish we had this back home. And it was just so beautiful. I'm like, how can, how can the world be this pretty? (laughs) Like, it's so cool. Uh, so I miss the nature and, like, all the views and everything. And just, like, having that little bodega in the corner where I could go get my $5 or 5 euro, sorry, 5 euro deal where um, I get my little bagged lunch for the day. It's kind of like a school lunch, they called it. So you get, like, a you see them, like, slice the, the meat for you, like the deli meat, right there. Uh, they slice the deli cheese for you. They slice the baguette. And then they just make it into a sandwich and wrap it up. And here you go. I'm like, that is the coolest thing. Cause like, it's never that fresh <laughs> back home when it's like deli meat. You have to like assemble it yourself. They don't just like make you a sandwich. And then, you know, you get your little, uh, I had a font limon that I always got. Cause we didn't have font limon back in the States at, at the time. And it was so much better than the orange one and the chips. But, uh, I miss a lot of the people I hung out with there. Um, yeah, that's a thing. So when I got there, the first person I met was not on my program. I went there a day early because I thought, cool, this will be like a challenge for me to try to like navigate the place before I have help from my program. So it'll be like I'm actually like traveling alone. And when I got there, I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea where to go. 
or what to do? Mm-hmm. Why did I do this? And at the bus stop outside the airport, I don't know, I just kind of waited for the bus. And in line, there was this guy named Ruben who was apparently studying abroad from Germany over in Sevilla. He's from Frankfurt. And he and I started talking in Spanish. And I guess we, uh, he's like, you know, yeah, come, come with me. I'm going to this uh, hostel. We can, you can bunk there. And that way you don't have to go find a place. I'm like, okay, uh, I guess I'm going to trust the stranger. Sounds good. Uh, So we we end up becoming fast friends actually. And, <clears throat> hung out and chatted a lot during the time I was there. And uh, he was kind of my in with the other European students, um, not on my program. <laughs> I was on a, a program with like five American students, but like I didn't meet them until like two days later. But by that time I'd already like met Ruben and like a couple of his friends who were there from Germany. And I actually found myself spending more time with the Europeans than the Americans. <laughs> Like, you know, they had better house parties. So, <laughs> yeah, like, every weekend they were partying. I'm like, what is what is up with these people? Like, they're having, like, full-ass ragers, like, in this in these flats, like, every weekend. Like, beer pong and flip cup and, you know, just all the stuff. And, like, sounds fun, you know? And then we all go out to the club, too, afterwards. So, like, we're still actually going out on the town and... And, like, all my American friends were just so, like, vanilla. Like, they just wanted to, like, have a nice quiet night in or just go to a little restaurant around the corner. And I'm like, y'all are boring. Like, come on, let's go <laughs> let's go do some crazy stuff. And so I think a lot of my time in Spain was spent, like, obviously learning. But, I mean, I just, I took every chance I got to, like, speak Spanish. And I think that's why I haven't forgotten it yet. I actually speak it at work sometimes with my coworkers who are from Mexico. But but I, I miss I miss that feeling of like all of us are in this foreign country together and none of us really know how things are going to go here. We all are just trying stuff together for the first time and Yeah, I, I think that I recommend people travel with friends if possible. I know there's like that whole travel alone thing and that has its own interesting benefits but i think experiencing another place in the world is better with other people honestly yeah i think that especially when you're very young like when you're like 20 22 traveling with friends like doing a backpacking trip is one of the best things that you can do but at the same time i also think that traveling alone is something that you must do at least once in your life because you'll get to know so much about yourself and your likes and dislikes without yeah. having other people around you. You're just there alone and you end up making friends along the way anyways, if you want to, if you're open to it. So I think that it can also be very beneficial, especially if you're someone that doesn't really like being alone because many people, they're kind of afraid of being alone because they don't really <laughs> like their own company so yeah. it's it's good as well. But yeah, man, I I got nostalgic myself just thinking about Spain and those types of experiences and how much fun you had with those European frat boys. <laughs> yeah, they were I I didn't expect that that was going to be my experience over there. I thought it was going to be like this oh, like really cultured experience like oh, we're going to see so many like interesting art and and like we still saw a lot of art and everything and a lot of cool architecture and whatnot but like yeah there were <laughs> there's a lot of debauchery happening out there too <laughs> <laughs> and the clubs are wild i i have sorry to say that the la- like when my wife and i went we found out that the one that i went to a lot with those friends it, it had closed down during covid so Yeah, it was like this really beautiful old house, like a historic house that they turned into a nightclub. And yeah, I guess some things don't last forever. Yeah, the thing about traveling alone, though, I I actually found myself being alone more often than I was with the American people on the program whenever I had like free time away from the European students. I guess I just like to, I I knew that I wanted to see more of the city than anybody else really did. (laughs) And so 
I was okay doing that, just going off on my own and having my own little discoveries, you know? But I, I, I do agree more people should do that and just be more open to being by yourself and seeing what you can uncover, you know? There's... I feel like if people treat it like a treasure hunt, like they're Lara Croft or something, that could be could be less scary, I guess. Like, you're just on an adventure, you know? Who knows what could happen? You're out in the world alone, doing whatever. Nobody can yeah, tell you what to do. It's like, it's like just, a video game, if you think about it. Yeah. You're in a, a different <laughs> stage of the game, and, like, open world, you don't know anything, you don't know anyone, so it's super fun. Yeah. It is. You said you went to Spain too, huh? Yeah, I did. And actually, the first city I went to in Spain was Sevilla as well. So I was thinking about there. And it's such a beautiful place. Yeah. The architecture and all of those old things are so... You get the gelato on the street? I did get some ice cream, but it was in the winter. So oh, yeah. really... I didn't get the experience of the Andalusia heat, thankfully, I oh. guess, because it's so hot. Yeah, it's pretty hot. <laughs> but, yeah, man, I, I kind of would love to see Spain in the winter, though. I actually haven't experienced that, so, I mean, it's still beautiful. Oh, yeah. I guess it's it worth is, the trip. It is. It's, it's a beautiful country and many great people as well, the art, the food. Like, it's one of my favorite places ever in Spain. It's just comforting. I don't know how else to put it. It just feels like home, even though I didn't grow up there. It just feels like, yeah, I could hang out here for another year if I needed to. Yeah, and since you work remote, you probably could if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure my Portugal friends would like that at work. Those, yeah, those you folks. can meet up with them. Portugal is also <laughs> a really nice place. Yeah, I haven't been yet. I've only heard good things about Lisbon, though. Yeah, Where, it, if you, you go, you should go to other places as well. Like Porto is very nice as well. And other places near Porto and near Lisbon. Yeah, there, there's a lot to do. It's a, it's a small country, but it has a lot of beautiful places. Yeah, I guess it's got to be on the bucket list. Because and the food uh, is to die for, man, and super cheap. Oh, yeah? <laughs> super cheap. <laughs> is it cheaper than Spain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's a little cheaper than Spain. and Oh, wow. Of course, okay. they've gone through inflation lately, so I'm not sure. But well, like yeah. for 10 euros, you could have like a meal with an appetizer, the like the main dish, and mm -hmm. a glass of beer or wine or soda, whatever you wanted. So it was very... And the food is always great. Like the the standard is very high. Yeah, I remember that about Spain, too. I'm like, dang, the quality of food we're getting, you'd be paying triple in the U.S. for this. Like, it's pretty nice. They care. Or maybe it's just that we have gross food in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> and so getting the nice stuff costs more. <laughs> yeah, I think but... it's a little bit of both, I guess. <laughs> is it but mostly yeah, seafood yeah. in Portugal? Or is it, like, more all Mediterranean-type stuff? Yeah, they have a lot of seafood, but it's not only seafood. They have other things as well, but yeah, they have a lot of seafood. Okay, so I'm not just eating octopus when I go there, is what you're saying? No, no. They have a lot of <laughs> fish, They have, but also they do eat meat, they do eat pork, they do eat chicken, so you can have a little bit of everything, I guess. Sweet, man. Yeah. All right, man. So Porto and... Well, if I had to go to one, would you say Porto or Lisbon? Or Lisboa, right? Is the... Lisboa, yeah. Wow, yeah. I think if you can, you probably should go to both. I mean, Porto has a special place in my heart, so I kind of edge towards Porto, but it's Okay. It's it's really not that big of a city. Like in a couple of days, two to three days, you can pretty much see everything. Mm -hmm. But it's very you know, JK Rowling lived there for a while when she was <laughs> No way. Yeah, so so she got a lot of her inspiration for Harry Potter from there and also from Edinburgh. So you, you can kind of feel it in some places that you go because it kind of has that vibe, that Harry Potter kind of vibe, like kind of okay. a middle age kind of building. So it's it's a really interesting place. Like you should definitely go if you ever go to Portugal. 
But and this one is also very nice. But I, yeah, my heart's with Porto to be honest. Okay, well, I'll keep that in mind because I, I am always a fan of not going down the beaten path if there's a better alternative. So, yeah, like same with like India. I've asked people like, where where would you go? You know, and it's not like what I would expect. It's always some city that I've never heard of before. <laughs> so that you got to go to the hidden gems. I think when you're gonna visit places, definitely, man, definitely. Yeah, India is a place that I think you have a bit of everything there as well. You can have like the best place ever, and also the worst place ever in the same country. <laughs> and it's yep. a very big country as well. So, yeah, well, to anybody who wants to visit Wisconsin and the U.S., Door County, I'm gonna definitely tell people to come here because i mean other than like the upper peninsula like the northern part of the state i feel like this is just a gorgeous place got like a lot of like the like the water like you got beaches you got um hiking trails bluffs uh you've got lots of green everywhere but it's also like that small town feel where you have like the local bakery and you know there's there's a lot of like community events out here we've found like there's always something to do and i think that's 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 special it is and all of the pictures that you put out like they're always it always gives a good vibe and i'd like to visit sometime well um tonight there's a rather interesting event going on that we're gonna go to it's at a bird sanctuary but guess what the event is it's so messed up (laughs) i have no idea wings (laughs) (laughs) Who came up with this? I don't know, but I hope there's not chickens there because they'd feel bad. <laughs> I'd feel really bad just eating wings in front of chickens. It's like I'm eating your your relatives. Or yeah, that, that's a bit dark, man. <laughs> it's pretty... it's... But it's, it's mostly owls, kind of, I think. Kind of a genius idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like shock marketing almost. It is. Come eat birds at the sanctuary. <laughs> At least you're not eating their eggs. No, 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 I don't want to to do that. No, it's supposed to be like owls, I think. Um, Maybe hawks, I'm not sure, but probably like rarer birds and just chickens. So they're like, we can eat the common chickens and the the special exotic animals can watch. (laughs) That's even weirder, I feel like. It's fine. But yeah, we're going to go do that tonight. So that should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, man. Let me know what happens after that. If the, the owls try to scoop up the wings from your plate or anything. <laughs> if the birds eat the wings, I'll be a little bit disturbed. But that's nature, right? Nature be crazy. I mean, we eat other mammals. So. That's true. I guess I didn't think about that. <laughs> we eat within our own phylum, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, nature is messed up. Oh, yeah. For sure. So, Stephen, what would you tell your 18-year-old self if you could talk to him right now? Stop worrying about girls. <laughs> just just stop, dude. Like, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> like, it's, it'll happen eventually. Uh, I think that that's what I would tell myself. Just, like, focus on being awesome and, like, do everything you want to do as like now because yeah when you get older and you have a full-time job it's a lot harder and I, the funny thing is i'm pretty sure my parents told me this <laughs> but we don't listen right it's not that i didn't get to do what i wanted i feel like my 20s were pretty awesome but i think that there's a lot of things that like i i remember like sinking like three years of my life into the wrong person and it's like that probably helped me find the right person, but also, what could what else could I have done with those three years? <laughs> probably a lot. So yeah, I think there's still a little bit of regret there, but you know, life goes on. I ended up in a good spot, so sometimes that's all that matters. But yeah, I'd tell myself to stop worrying so much about girls. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell that to my younger self as well. <laughs> It's alluring, right? Like, it's a little too easy to just chase after girls all the time. Yeah, I think that's something that happens to young boys. And 
as they say as well, like um, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> youth is definitely wasted on. I mean, I wish in our thirties I could we could have the same level of freedom that we did in our twenties. Because like, dang, we would uh, we would do things a little differently, I think, than our twenty year old self. Yeah, you know, there's this triad. So it's like money time and energy so when you're super young you're a kid you have time and you have energy but you don't have money and then when you're like middle age or you you have money and you have energy but you don't have time and then when you're Mm -hmm. old you have time and you have money but you don't have energy (laughs) so (laughs) yeah i guess there are those stages in life but as long as we have energy i think that's a great thing and that we can still enjoy a lot of things. Maybe not as much, like you don't have as much free time, but at the same time, since you don't have that much time, you make the best out of it. You don't waste it like when you we were super young. Yeah, it's like that thing in sales about scarcity. You know, it makes something more beautiful or more attractive if you think if you think that there's only like a, a limited amount of it. And whether that's like, time to enjoy your ice cream cone or the number of days left on your vacation. I feel like it just, it kind of makes you focus really, really hard on that, that thing that you still do have in front of you. You know, if you allow that to be the focus instead of like what you're not going to have after that, that's gone. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Sorry, cut you off. I don't, I don't think I was even going to say anything. (laughs) Yeah, I I think this is a real problem in people's lives because you kind of forget that you can also enjoy your day-to-day life. You can also explore a little bit wherever you live. You can also mm-hmm. you can always go to a new place and eat something different. You can always if you have that mindset, you can enjoy life as well in your day-to-day life. You don't need to just live like you don't need to go to a Greek island to have fun or to like have a Lambo or something like that. You can have fun Mm -hmm. those smaller things that are actually the big things. They really are the big things because they're the most prevalent. Like we, we encounter them every day. So if we can find a way to make them enjoyable, then our entire life becomes an enjoyable, you know, those vacations are only like pattern interrupts, you know, they don't really, they don't really like constitute they, they don't have enough like energy so to speak to like spread out across the rest of your year so like th- all those days in between you still got to do something with those <laughs> like <laughs> the vacation isn't going to save you <laughs> um i agree though it's funny you say the thing about trying a new menu item like I can think of so many things I've never tried at McDonald's, for example. And it's such a common place. I've eaten there so many times. And there are at least a handful of things I've never eaten. And that goes for pretty much every restaurant, no matter how often I've visited it. So just like, yeah, it it makes you wonder how many other things we just do out of habit on autopilot. (laughs) Like, could we make a different choice? I don't know. Probably. Yeah, definitely, man. And then like we we kind of get that blurred memory because you went to the same place so many times and you always eat the same thing. So it's kind of the same thing in your brain. But yeah. if you were doing new things like trying a different dish or going to a different restaurant, you'd have a bunch of different memories, even if sometimes, of course, you will, if you're being bold with your choices. You won't like every dish you try, but at least we'll remember. I hate that one. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and then you have a so story. It's a different memory. You, know? you either get joy or you get a story. That's kind of the way I see life and experiences in general. So, like, I think people are afraid of having a bad feeling when they do something because they don't see the story. They don't see the value in like having something to laugh about later. And that blocks people off from a lot of potentially really interesting things. You know, like I, I don't really think I'm much of a sports fan. You know, I 
I always kind of rebelled against it. Like, I'll never play football with the other guys. I'm just going to go on the playground, you know, while they're doing that. Screw football and competitive sports, right? And so, but I would still want to go to a game just to see what it's like. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's fun. Like, <laughs> I'm not, like, it, it's not that you have to watch the game. Most people don't even watch the game. They just do other stuff, you know, like get some concessions or chat with other people in the stands or maybe there's other stuff. So I don't know. I I feel like some people let their opinions influence what they're allowed to do. But like, just cause I'm not really a football fan doesn't mean I can't go watch a Packers game <laughs> just to appreciate the history behind that tradition, you know? Yeah, man, I totally agree with that philosophy and you should definitely go to a Packers game and put on the cheese hat. <laughs> I t- it's right here now. Like, I'm so close to Green Bay, I could throw a rock at it, basically. No, dude, you should definitely go next season then because <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a nice experience, especially if you don't go to every game. So mm-hmm. it's just it will be a pattern interrupt in your life and a memory that you will always remember. So I think that's a very good idea. You should definitely do that. Yeah, you know, I don't know why this popped into my head when you mentioned the thing about like when you like you know you said that if you eat the same thing at the same restaurant your brain takes it in as like the same thing and you don't really remember it <clears throat> it kind of reminds me of automation you know like if you don't have to think about it then it's automated right so in coding there's a way to kind of repeat the same logic over and over you just call the name of that lot like you put all that logic in a block and then you name it and then you call that, call it by name wherever you want it to happen in the code. That's kind of what we're doing if we just eat at the same place and do the same thing over and over and over. We're just like, okay, let's insert this block of life over here into my day. Um, great. I already know what's going to happen. Nice and predictable. I'm going to slap that there. And then I'll do something else. So <laughs> I feel like a lot of us just like, have these blocks of like actions or experiences or something that we've done so many times it's like a predictable outcome so we know what the input is we know what the output is <laughs> and so we just decide like okay well instead of having to go through the effort of making a new block of experiences i just grab from my bag of blocks and there you go and it just sounds so boring when you put it that way <laughs> Like, that's it's just exactly what we do with our like lives. That, man. It's exactly that. Have you <laughs> like seen you the movie your calendar and Just put blocks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have. That's a funny movie. I remember the duck scene with the, <laughs> the dog. Yeah, but that's exactly what happens when he starts clicking the fast forward button. Like, he's just living through these moments in autopilot. And that's what most people end up doing. Like, that's why people. So many people in, on the internet now, they say that you should meditate or do some mindfulness exercises as well, because otherwise you just go on autopilot and do everything on autopilot. And then you get like those people that are suddenly they're 50 or 60 and they're like, where the hell did my life go? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like a life because, you know, uh, you have like two options every day, right? No matter what, no matter what your plans are, you have two options. You can reach into this bag the sack right of things you already know you can do and what's going to happen after you do them and like put those on your calendar or you can try to make a new one you know make a new one and then throw that in the bag but if you never reach over and try to like make something new yeah you're just recycling your own life over and over again (laughs) it's like (laughs) that's not life that's just (laughs) that's just like we're we're willingly living on autopilot, basically. And that just sounds yeah. weird because we're capable of so much more than that. And man, would you like to talk about your your work, helping people getting a QA job? Yeah. So I I spent like the last year trying to uh just assemble all of my understandings of the job market and you know, all that goes into job hunting as a QA, because I think that I can help people get jobs more quickly. The market has been pretty unforgivable. So, I mean, I've put together some some free resources like the um, 
they call it like the QA top performer playbook, which is like this course that I made based on, um, well, I think the whole story is in there somewhere, <laughs> uh, in like the first couple of, of videos. But basically I, I found out why people promoted me. Uh, so just, you know, within the first company that I worked at and I turned that strategy into a course where I teach people how to do the things that got me promotions. Uh, and then from there, I've, I've made a couple of um, lower ticket products like QA Job Magnet, which is really just like a brain dump of all the things I know about how to get a job faster uh, that most people don't think about. Uh, and then aside from that, I've been helping people do like through like paid LinkedIn resume reviews. Um, I used to do them for free, but a lot of people were asking me about them. So I decided to start charging for them so that I could <laughs> like protect my time a bit more. Because believe it or not, it takes a little bit of time to record a resume review or LinkedIn review video, usually like 10 to 20 minutes. But it's uh, I'm just like analyzing the whole time. So it does take a lot of energy. Yeah, I, I like to think that I've helped, I, I mean, not I like to think, like, I, I know that I've actually helped a couple of people get jobs already. Like, I did free calls on ADP list for a little while. Um, I've gotten, like, 11 good reviews, like, no bad reviews so far, thank goodness, but uh, 11 good reviews from people who I've chatted with, and uh, one of them I know has, like, a couple months after we started talking, they got a job, um, they got their next QA job, and then... I've been able to hop on calls with other folks and live teach them skills that they didn't know how to do, but I do from like all of my diverse QA automation experience. So yeah, it's, it's just been really rewarding. It's a lot of fun and I'm just trying to find ways to do it more for like full time because I like doing, I like helping people a lot in this space because I think a lot of people misunderstand job hunting. A lot of people are using outdated strategies and this is not the time to be using outdated strategies <laughs> because the market is tougher than ever. And I've seen people be out of work for like over a year and it's really sad, but wow. um, there's other people who get it and I see them landing jobs just as quickly as me. So, I mean, I've gotten like two roles in this market in the last couple of years, basically still able to hop companies, no problem, but yeah, some people just, they need a little bit of guidance to push in the right direction, and then they start getting calls. That was kind of how it was for me. Um, I actually reached out to Danny Thompson. Anybody in tech on, or tech Twitter or LinkedIn probably knows who he is. It's like this front-end developer that used to be like fried chicken in a gas station before he went into tech. So he's like a similar story to me where he started off in like these low-paying jobs and learned what he needed to learn and then like took the community route into tech, but uh, he does LinkedIn and resume reviews also. And that was kind of where I got the idea. He charges like $69 for them though. And he totally can charge more. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I think he could, but he won't at least not yet. Uh, he just landed his first director role. Like he's definitely like out in the space all the time helping people, but he helped me with my resume. And I was having trouble getting calls back. And then after his resume review, all of a sudden, now I'm getting calls back. So it really does make a difference. People think, oh, no, I can just do it myself. But man, like, if you just ask one person to look at your stuff, you'll probably get a lot of a room for improvement. I had like 14 notes after that 45-minute call with him. <laughs> and I just wow. actioned on them all. I actioned on all of them. And you'll put the resumes next to each other. One looks gross now, and the other one looks great. So I think that basically in a nutshell, uh, the reason I started doing this is I think a lot of people just don't get it. They don't understand what they need to know to have more success job hunting. And so I'm just trying to go all in and see if I can help someone one-on-one -on -one in like a higher pressure, more accountable type situation. And so, yeah, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I guess all of this was a testament to the power behind hiring someone that can help you. Like you said, you hire, hired the guy or you were talking to him and he really helped you completely transform your CV and make it a thousand times better. So you just 
by the time. So you compress your the time between where you are and where you're going by so much mm-hmm. if you just have someone help you. And I guess to anyone that wants to become a QA tester or a QA engineer, they should talk to you so you can help them do this. Yeah. And I mean, they can reach me on LinkedIn. They can reach me on Twitter or X, Twex, on Twix. Right? I think I've heard people call it Twix as a joke. But yeah, I I call my thing the QA sidekick system because that's what I am. I'm the sidekick. You're the hero. You know, you're, it's your hero's journey. I'm just trying to help and get you there faster. But yeah, that's that's kind of the thing. Just trying to do the whole one-on-one thing because I've gotten help with that, trying to even put this together because I didn't know where to start <laughs> trying to put something like this together. But it really does make a difference when you work with somebody directly and there's money on the line because you pay attention more. <laughs> Like you actually take it seriously because your goal is to get the value back that you invested in. And Definitely. when that's in, on your mind all the time, like you're going to do what it takes. You're going to do whatever it takes. And that's going to get you where you want to go faster. Yeah. You got to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. I mean, I could ask anybody for a free resume review. I probably wouldn't have edited my resume though. Cause I didn't pay for it. <laughs> so, like anybody can give a resume review, you know? Uh, it's really just yeah. that thought in your head of like, well, I paid 69 bucks for this. I better see if it works, you know, because otherwise I'm out 69 bucks and no job. So well, if I at least want to know if it gets me a job or not, like it would be a shame if it did and I didn't do anything about it. Yeah, so. you're more open to, like you said, you were taking a bunch of notes and you actually took action. Maybe if it was free, you take two notes and take action on one instead of yeah. Taking note on 14 points and taking action on, on all of them. And, yeah, you know, I usually ask this at the tail end of the episode. And okay. I'm really interested to knowing your answer, man. What's your definition of success? Oh, boy. Man, that's a, that's a bomb right there. <laughs> Hold on. Let me think. For... I think my definition of success is being able to decide where I show up. And I think that that's really what it boils down to for me. Cause a lot of people could just say freedom. That's like a cop out in my opinion, because that could mean a lot of different things. I think for me, it's, I want to choose which room I'm in with which people. And I want to be able to say why I'm there. And it's because of something I want, not because of something somebody else wants, you know? So, like, I'm probably not an employee type forever. (laughs) I think that I ultimately want to go my own way. And the reason for that isn't just because I want to do whatever I want all the time. It's it's because I want to help the people I want to help in the way that I want to help them. And I think that that is such a gift if you can get to a place like that. That's awesome. What about you? Good question. Well, my definition of success nowadays would probably be being able to have freedom in terms of time and energy money like to do things not necessarily that do super lavish things but you know having that freedom of saying you know what let's travel for two weeks to whatever place i i want to go to i don't know maybe like super bowl for for instance like some event that I really always wanted to go to, but never had the chance, like being able Mm -hmm. to have those options, but at the same time doing very meaningful work and having time for the people that you love as well. So having a bit of that balance, I think would be a nice definition for me. Yeah. I can't forget about the people in your life, you know, because they're, I feel like they're what makes life worth living when you're not working. Even yeah, when otherwise you're, you're just defining yourself by your outputs, but at the same time, you need to have that sense like of home, you know? Yeah, and, and that's like doesn't the even... way we show up too, right? It's not yeah. just, we don't just show up at work, we show up for our, our loved ones. Yeah, and even, I think you need to have some sense. It doesn't even need to have to be your own family. Like, you're, you can have a very, well, 
knit group of friends that you're very close to. It can be anything really, but having this place where you can really truly be yourself and and just relax. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in chosen family. You choose the people that support you in the way that you are right now. Not in the way you think you should be or in the way that you used to be. <laughs> But like you today, who's who's a fan of you today and who wants to see you grow and succeed? And that's that should be your family, in my opinion. They yeah, may be definitely. related to you. They may not be. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. Like people that truly resonate with who you are right now and with who you want to become. I think when you find those people, you need to really cherish them and just keep them around because they're the ones that you will want to be around for a long time. Yeah, the writer does. Yeah, you know, I think that that phrase, like, brother from another mother, I think that's <laughs> such a true thing. Yeah, I've got a few of those. But, uh, and, you know, friends change over time, too. So does family. Like, maybe, yeah. maybe you're a fit for someone, they're a fit for you now, and then five years from now, you're very different people. I've had that happen to me. And yeah, that's and okay, you know? You also change, so... Sometimes you kind of grow apart. Each one grows towards one direction and and it happens. And yeah. That doesn't mean you won't like them anymore and then you can't <laughs> see them sometimes, but eventually that's what ends up happening in many cases. And man, do you want to say any last considerations, any last thoughts that you're having? I guess uh, if there's one thing I've learned, there's a lot of things I've learned over like the last... 10 years, just like have a higher standard for your life. I think a lot of people need to hear that. Just like believe that you deserve an amazing life. Because if you start there, I mean, you're just more willing to chase things that are hard. I, I, I think that before I realized that life was something that should be amazing, I kind of accepted mediocrity <laughs> and like things that I wouldn't even touch now as like a life situation. And yeah, I think more people just need to listen to what my mentor told me one time back when I was on the front end team. And uh, I did, I did eventually get to do web development for like six months, by the way, <laughs> but that was kind of cool. But I remember my mentor's words. Cause like, I still have to remind myself some days. Uh, so I'm giving them to everybody else today. Have some faith in yourself. Cause that's very powerful, man. At the end of the day, man, that's you're the only one who's on your team. <laughs> like if everybody else leaves, you still got to be on your team. So <laughs> have some faith in yourself. Believe that you you have some greatness waiting for you if you put it. That's very powerful, man. Thank you so much for coming. This I'm just happy you invited me, man. It was it was a treat. I'm glad we finally got to chat too. This is great. Yeah, man. You're a cool, you're a cool dude.